Welcome to Asian American Life. I'm your host, Ernabel DeMillo. We're at the Noguchi Museum to commemorate the 75th anniversary of the Day of Remembrance, when nearly 120,000 Japanese and Japanese Americans were sent to internment camps. The guests on our show were either interned themselves or had family and friends who were sent to the camps. One man voluntarily turned himself in, the artist and sculptor Isamu Noguchi. We'll take a closer look at how his experiences affected his work. But first, here's what's ahead on our show. Harsh Canvas, Minnie Rowe shares the art and life of Henry Sugimoto. Cropping up new lives, Tina Beth Pina reports why one farm employed thousands of internees. Paul Lin's special report on lessons learned. Are we seeing the same patterns of fear and hate today? Plus, remembering the darkest day in Asian American history. This and more on Asian American Life. Self interned 1942, Noguchi in Post and War Relocation Center, explores the artist's decision to turn himself in at the Arizona detention camp. He was a New Yorker, so he was exempt, but he volunteered, hoping to contribute something to those who had been displaced. Here's a look at more. This exhibition really is about Noguchi's experience as an internee at Post and War Relocation Center. And it's important to say that Noguchi's experience there is not typical of the Japanese American internment experience because Noguchi chose to go in. So this exhibition really explores his decision, his time there, and some of the stories that came out of his experience there. So we are showing work from before, during, and after the period at post End, because this is an extraordinary American. He's biracial, bicultural. He's somebody who thought enormously about that and tried to make that a kind of a, a mission for himself. Um, he wrote a, a brilliant editorial, and it's called I Become an Issei. And the first couple lines of it are, uh, hybridity is the future, America is the nation of all nationalities for a moment when the United States was finally trying to figure out what it meant to be multicultural. And he's really an avatar for that thinking. You can learn more about self Intern 1942, Noguchi and Post and More Relocation Center by following us on Facebook at Asian American Life. It's been 75 years since thousands of Japanese and Japanese Americans were forced into internment camps. It was a day in history that changed the lives of so many. December 7, 1941, Japanese bombers shattered what was otherwise a peaceful morning in Hawaii. It was a surprise attack on the United States. That morning, more than 2,000 servicemen were killed and nearly 20 vessels were destroyed, including eight battleships. America declared war. Yesterday, December 7, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. Soon after, public opinion turned against Japanese Americans. There were fears of another attack on U.S. soil and that there were spies within the community. Hearst newspaper columnist Henry McLemore famously wrote, herd them up, pack them off, and give them the inside room in the Badlands. Personally, I hate the Japanese. His sentiments were shared by many powerful people in the media and in government. Two months after the attack, President Franklin D. Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, a law that declared certain areas as war zones. Most of the West Coast's Japanese Americans, about 120,000 men, women, and children, were forcibly relocated from their homes into internment camps in the spring of 1942. More than half were U.S. citizens. There was absolute hysteria driven by economic greed, perceived national security, and uh, I think what has to be called uh, deep-seated racism. Grant Ujifusa, a third-generation Japanese-American, grew up in Wyoming, outside what was deemed the militarized zone. His family, thanks to geography, were able to stay in their homes. His grandfather, in fact, visited a nearby camp, the famous Hart Mountain, during the winter months. Guards waved him in and out. 
When the war was over, the Japanese Americans were finally allowed to leave, but many had lost everything, their homes and their livelihood. They also faced racism and violence. But most returned to California. They had been denied not only their rights and their dignity, but their property. So they really had to start over again. Inspired by the civil rights movement, the Japanese American Citizens League launched the Campaign for Redress and Reparation in the 1970s. JLCL recruited Ujifusa. He had written the Almanac of American Politics and had access to lawmakers. It was a grassroots effort that took more than a decade. Even after the Senate and House eventually passed the bill, there was a potential snag. Then-President Ronald Reagan publicly said he would veto the bill. So how did Ujifusa change Reagan's mind? He did so with the help of a fallen soldier named Kazuo Masuda from Fountain Valley, California. Sergeant Masuda died fighting in a battle in Italy while serving in the all-Nisei Japanese American Regiment, the 442. He was only 24 and received the Distinguished Service Cross. He wanted to be buried in his hometown cemetery in Fountain Valley, which was then agricultural. But when his sister showed up at town hall, the town father said, we don't bury Japs here. No Japs in our cemetery. And that's when renowned General Joe Vinegar Stilwell stepped in. Vinegar Stilwell had fought side by side with Japanese American soldiers, and he admired their bravery. He personally went to Masudo's hometown. Stillwell came to Mount Valley and said, this soldier's gonna be buried here. We're gonna make an example of you SOBs, and I'm gonna have a nice ceremony for Kaz's mother, and I'm gonna present her with a Distinguished Service Cross. I'm invited to attend that ceremony at the modest farmhouse of the Masudas was a young movie star, Army Captain Ronald Reagan. He said, Thank you, Mr. and Mrs. Masuda, for the sacrifice of your son. We are indebted to you. A young Ronald Reagan, who was an FDR Democrat at the time, said, quote, the blood that has soaked in the sand is all one color. Ujifusa, with the help of then New Jersey Governor Tom Kane, reminded Reagan of that day and the words he spoke at that funeral. And Reagan changed his mind. This action was taken without trial, without jury. It was based solely on race. But these 120,000 were American. Reagan signed the Civil Liberties Act of 1988 with the Masuda family in attendance. The act granted surviving attorneys $20,000 each and a formal apology stating the government's actions were based on race prejudice, war hysteria, and the failure of political leadership. It meant a very great deal. It, it reached the very core of our being, which is to say, a restoration of our rights, of our dignity, of our place in this country, uh, and as I like to think about it, our forebears now rest more easily. I'm Ernabel DeMillo for Asian American Life. I'm Minnie Rowe. Artist Henry Sugimoto was one of the many Japanese Americans incarcerated in the wake of Pearl Harbor. During his time in the internment camps, he painted and sketched hundreds of vignettes depicting everyday life in the barracks. It's a valuable legacy, the only one of its kind, and it paints a vivid picture of what life was really like behind the barbed wires. And this is in the camp. You see the barracks and the guard tower. Mm -hmm. It's a glimpse into a far distant past, a frozen moment in time. Unlike photographs, however, in art, the emotions and despair of the artist yielding the brush are only too keenly felt. It was um, something that was open-ended. There was no sense of uh, what was going to happen or how long it was going to be. Madeline Sugimoto is the artist's daughter. She was only six years old when her family was sent to the Jerome, Arkansas internment camp in 1942. She admits her childhood memories of the camps are not entirely unpleasant. It was fun. And uh, what happened was I was a tomboy, so I had these three Asaki brothers that I uh, played with, and we would try to sneak out beyond the barbed wires 
and go outside of the camp. The best way to do that was to stand right underneath the guard tower because then the military police, the MPs that are in there, wouldn't see us. And so we would do that. We would just go under the guard tower and below the barbed wire and then go into the outside area. But her father's work illustrates a much darker side, a world where overnight American citizens were forced to leave their homes and livelihood, herded like cattle as depicted in this painting, to a prison surrounded by guards and fences, all because they looked like the enemy. Part of what he would be doing is uh, seeing what was happening to people in everyday life and, and capturing it in images. What he did was he did paint some of the guard tower and the barbed wire fence areas just to capture what it was like as far as the outdoors. And he also did the pictures of uh, some of the men who played Go, which is a Japanese game like checkers. There's a little girl, she has the Dutch bob, and she has, uh, she's sitting on some kind of uh, property that was gonna go to camp and has a tag on her and it was me because at the time all the families instead of using their names were assigned a specific number for each family. Prior to Pearl Harbor, Sugimoto was a thriving artist focusing on landscapes and city scenes. However, his style and subject matter radically shifted following his captivity. His paintings conveyed the injustice and discrimination he and his fellow Japanese Americans suffered at the hands of the U.S. government. At Jerome, he worked as a high school art teacher, which allowed him access to scarce art supplies. My father, uh, being a teacher, ordered art supplies through the U.S. government. I remember him saying that uh, that was primarily for the students, but then I would ask or order a few brushes and tubes of paint so that I could do my painting. He was resourceful as well, gathering canvas bags that people had cast aside after unpacking their belongings in camp and together with scraps of wood scavenged from the grounds, he made frames for his canvases, which were then transformed into narratives of camp life seen through an artist's eye. At the end of World War II, the family relocated to New York City. Sugimoto worked part-time at a fabric design company while devoting his spare time to pursuing his art. While he held several exhibits throughout his lifetime, art remained his passion, but not a road to wealth. After he passed away in 1990 at the age of 90, Madeleine Sugimoto donated several of his pieces to the National Museum of American History at the Smithsonian. And the rest of his life's work, over 700 paintings, diaries, woodblocks, and artist tools, went to the Japanese American National Museum in Los Angeles. It is the museum's largest collection. I didn't want things that I had to just deteriorate and, and be gone or not taken care of. And I felt this was valuable and important enough for my, my father's life and art that it should be preserved in some way. Not to mention, it's an important history lesson that Sugimoto hopes will educate generations to come about the devastating consequences of racial discrimination. Currently, none of Sugimoto's vast body of work is displayed anywhere. His daughter holds out hope that maybe one day her father's work will once again be exhibited for all to see. I'm Minnie Rowe for Asian American Life. I'm Tina Beth Pina. During World War II, thousands of incarcerated Japanese Americans became migrant farm workers out east. It was a way to escape the internment camps and start a new chapter in their lives. Walk down any frozen food aisle and you'll find America's favorite cream spinach for sale. Behind this popular dish is a little known Japanese American history that dates back to 1944. Farmer save the world. More beans. Farmer save the world. More milk. More. More rhubarb. More. More spinach. More. Facing a shortage of farm laborers during World War II, Charles Franklin Seabrook enlisted nearly 2,500 Japanese Americans from concentration camps to live and work on his farm and processing plant in Cumberland County, New Jersey. 
It was part of the U.S. government's war relocation authority effort. Families like Theodore Yoshikami didn't have much of a choice, either stay in prison behind barbed wire fence or head east and move from one cramped barrack to another. You had to have a job to, to leave the camp, so he, I think they agreed that they would, um, they would want to go work. It's a place to live, you can get away, and you, know, you, can, you have a job, and so, so many people started to do there, um, go there. And then that's when we decided, my father said fine, so the whole family decided to go. As part of the war effort, Seabrook partnered with Bird's Eye Foods and became the world's largest supplier of frozen foods to the military, earning him the title, the Henry Ford of Agriculture. The Yoshikamis were joined by 25 other ethnic groups, including Japanese Peruvian, Estonians, Italians, Caribbeans, and even German prisoners of war. They clocked in 12-hour days, seven days a week, at 50 cents an hour. My mother worked on the line there, which was hard. I think for the parents it was difficult, because the work for women was really hard. They were on the line packing vegetables, you know, all day. My father was fortunate, because he, I guess because he had some managerial skills from his own business, that he was able to work in the stockroom, where so people would come in and order certain supplies. Life for the Yoshikamis wasn't always full of hardship and struggles. Her father, George, was an entrepreneur, and her mother, Midori, sewed dresses in Hollywood. Then, in 1942, they lost everything and were interned at Tule Lake, California, where Theodora was born and raised. To avoid deportation to Japan, her parents were interrogated and had to prove their allegiance to the United States. Our family pretty much said, you know, we're U.S. citizens, they were going to stay here, and you know, and a lot of people who were there anyway had never been to Japan, so they were like, what are they asking these questions? We haven't even seen Japan. We don't even know who this emperor is. Giving the right answer meant a second chance and a job out east. The family moved in 1943. We lived on MacArthur Drive, <laughs> you know, who ran the war, basically, and, um, and then there was a Def Jefferson Street. So it was almost like, you know, let remind you that this is America. And yet I think our parents were trying to raise us so that we would become more American. I mean, that was the criticism why the Japanese were put into camps, although that wasn't necessarily true. But they said, oh, the Japanese, they're not learning the language and not learning, you know, the, the way the American way is. It's more like what white America is. They tried to make us become more white Americans. The Yoshikamis adapted to their new life of limited freedom. Yet despite their harsh reality, they did achieve the American dream. Their sons became a doctor, lawyer, and dentist. Theodora formed the first Asian American dance company and became a dancer and choreographer. I used to belong to this, uh, you know, children's theater group. Mm -hmm. Today, Teddy is imparting her knowledge onto the next generation by preserving the memory of her family's internment. Some of these it wasn't a great place to live. You know, it wasn't I, uh, the best place. If we, I think we would never have been there except for the, for the war. Seabrook Farms closed its doors in the 1980s, but many Japanese American workers stayed behind. 14 years later, residents reopened the Seabrook Educational and Cultural Center, remembering its history. As hundreds stopped by each year, one important lesson can be learned. Well, let's just hope it's never repeated, where the Japanese Americans are put into camps. It's, it's just like what's happening now in terms of doing the Muslim registry, and I just hope that really doesn't happen. The government itself is apologized to the Japanese community that this was unjust situation and should never have happened to. I'm Tina Beth Pina for Asian American Life. I'm Paul Lin. Decades after the incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II, Congress called it a grave injustice brought on by racial prejudice, war hysteria, and the failure of political leadership. One organization, Densho, aims to make sure this never happens again. And Densho is a Japanese term that means to pass stories on to the next generation. So it means like legacy. 
Growing up, Tom had learned about the U.S. putting Japanese Americans in prison camps after Pearl Harbor, but it wasn't until much later that he began to dig deeper. Along the way, he learned about the Shoah project run by Steven Spielberg. It would forever change the life of this former Microsoft general manager. And there was this incredible project where they were videotaping oral histories of Holocaust survivors. I felt it's important that it's not forgotten. And so uh, the light bulbs went off. I said, oh my gosh, you know, what a powerful project. So in 1996, Densho, the Japanese-American Legacy Project, was founded to ensure that the oral histories of incarcerated Japanese Americans would not be lost, including stories of the relocation and evacuation, government terms for when people had to leave their homes and liquidate businesses. Well, how about things like your, your father's business? Because eventually he yeah. had to... He lost it. ...to shut that down. He and lost a $10,000 restaurant. Never compensated. Not a penny. You know, they might have a grocery store or a dry cleaning business. And just imagine if you had one week before you had to leave. And, and I guess what you see in these situations is not only the fear and hatred, but the, the greed aspect in humans. What the government chose to show of the process were films like this, portraying Japanese Americans cheerfully uprooting from their lives to embark on a U.S. mandated adventure. Densho interviews with survivors shed a far different light on what happened once they got to facilities repurposed as detention centers before shipping off to what FDR referred to as concentration camps. They restructured the fairgrounds and the parking lots into these temporary uh, hovels. Boy, it was a real a traumatic type of uh, living where you're in the former stoves where uh, the pigs and the cows and everything else were. Families of six and seven were crowded into one little spot. Since 1996, Densho has recorded some 1,800 hours of personal accounts from more than 900 interviews. But it wasn't easy to get people to open up and remember their wartime experience, being wrongfully imprisoned because of their heritage. So when we went out, we had to really encourage people to tell the stories, not just for themselves or for their children, but for those future generations. And so we really, really had to work for this. But when those testimonies could be shared, Tom learned, people often felt a great burden being lifted. What we, we found was that these people who, after they told their stories, oftentimes for the first time, started healing, and then their families started healing. And, we, and the way we knew this was that we started getting phone calls and emails from the children of the people we interviewed and they would start saying, so what happened to grandma or my mom or my dad? Because now they're different. An incredible story Tom shares about his own family centers around an uncle who, already incarcerated at Minidoka Prison Camp in Idaho, volunteered to serve in the Army during the Second World War. He died in action in Europe. A photograph from the 1940s shows his parents accepting the American flag for their eldest son. They stand, still in a prison camp, on a dusty field behind barbed wire. Despite this extreme sacrifice and incarceration, they still became U.S. citizens after the war. Today, Tom visits a memorial wall in Seattle bearing his uncle's name. And to me, that sort of um, emphasizes what being a U.S. citizen is, what, what American is. And when I go to high schools now, and we have discussions about you know, what does an American look like, I actually show that photograph of my grandparents accepting the American flag in an American concentration camp. They really get a sense of how powerful citizenship is and how hard people work to get it. And I think that's a, a powerful American story that people should know. The toughest part, Tom says, about the incarceration of Japanese Americans during the war was actually when they had to leave the camps they'd been imprisoned in for years to start over with nothing and to face continued prejudice from a fearful, angry American public. My father uh, took whatever jobs he could get. And of course, he never did go to college, and so he just had his high school education. And there was still a certain amount of discrimination in the community. 
It's just the sort of environment that concerns Tom today, the fear of terrorism, the ugly rhetoric on TV directed toward undocumented immigrants, Muslims, and people of color, and selective memory of history's lessons, as voiced recently by a supporter of Donald Trump on Fox News. We did it during World War II with Japanese, which you know, call it what you Come will, on. maybe, maybe you're wrong. Not, you're not proposing we go back to the days of internment camps, I hope. No, 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 I'm not proposing that at all, Megan. But what I am saying is that we need to protect that. America I mean, that's, first. That's the kind of stuff that gets people scared, Carl. Right. But it's, I'm just saying there is precedent for it. We have to be really vigilant. And so it's more than just assuming the Constitution and courts will protect us. Each of us as citizens, we have to fight. We have to, you know, every generation, we have to protect our liberties. Because if we don't, uh, they're easily um, lost. As Densho looks ahead, it's evolving its mission, tapping into the legacy of its stories with school visits to help the next generation take action. We're becoming much more outspoken. We're now creating curriculum that's not just about Japanese Americans, but it connects the stories to um, other communities of color, other, um, you know, with the Muslim community, with the Jewish community so that we can start sharing these stories and, and sharing these stories with students in a way that they can see the patterns of bigotry and racism. Ensuring that we never forget the legacy, resilience, and courage of Japanese Americans incarcerated in prison camps during the Second World War. I'm Paul Lin for Asian American Life. To learn more about this special, you can follow us on Facebook at Asian American Life. And be sure to stop by the Noguchi Museum to check out self turn 1942. I'm Renabelle DeMillo for Asian American Life. We'll see you next time.